infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. Now, there are many types of heart arrhythmias, with atrial fibrillation, or AFib, being the most common type of serious arrhythmia. Well, joining me today to discuss AFib and other arrhythmias is cardiac electrophysiologist and author of the very interesting and informative book, Restart Your Heart, Asim Desai, MD. Dr. Desai, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you, Robert. Well, let's go ahead and start out with the book itself, Restart Your Heart. Why did you write it? Um, you obviously thought there was a need, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Uh, I'd like to just take a step back and maybe define a few terms for the audience. Sure. Um, you know, the heart, heart's an engine, and it's got a plumbing system, it's got valves, and it has electricity. And the electrical aspect of it is interesting because the heart itself is able to create its own electricity and make the heartbeat. Then it's also connected to the brain, and there's a back and forth through what's called the autonomic nervous system, which we'll touch on a little bit later. So with the heart's electrical system, abnormal rhythms can occur, and these abnormal rhythms can occur from any of the four heart chambers, the two on the top, the atria, and the two on the bottom, the ventricles. And that's what's defined as a cardiac arrhythmia, an abnormal heart rhythm. So atrial fibrillation, AFib, as you mentioned, is the most common form worldwide. And so chances are in the audience, someone either has AFib or knows someone who has AFib. And in fact, the latest statistics indicate that one out of four people, one out of four, over the age of 40, will get AFib at some point in their life. So that includes everyone that's listening. That includes you and me. And you asked the question about why I wrote the book. And so it actually started out with a grieving process. So I lost my mom suddenly to a cardiac arrest, and everything happened so fast that I really didn't have time to process it. And being a philosophy major from college, I always liked to write. And so I started writing about that experience and writing about my own personal experiences with health, either family or myself uh, as well. And then happenstance occurred, just like many things in life. So I'm writing this chapter. I'm writing this introduction. I have no idea what the actual book is going to be about. And I walked a gentleman out of our heart rhythm clinic one day. And he had been in atrial fibrillation continuously, which is called persistent AFib, for about five years. And in the past, we would have said there's really no way of restoring his rhythm. The heart's a muscle. When you go into AFib, it develops a muscle memory for AFib. There's a term AFib begets AFib. Hmm. So chances are we wouldn't be able to get him back into rhythm. That's what we would have said even a few years ago. However, Due to advancements in our knowledge of AFib, as well as the technological advancements and techniques, I was able to get him back into rhythm. And so he turned to me. He had already seen two other cardiologists, and he already had his primary care physician, and everyone told him, you know, we wish we could do something, but there's really no treatment that could get you back into rhythm and keep you in rhythm. And so we were able to offer him a combination of treatments, and he walked out in a normal, what's called normal sinus rhythm, which is the normal electrical beat of the heart. And he turned to me, and, and this is really where it touched my soul, is he turned to me and looked at me in the eyes and started tearing up. And this is a pretty, you know, kind of macho guy who I'm sure doesn't tear up easily. And he turned to me and he said, you know, I, I really wish that there was an easier way to have found you and to have gotten into normal rhythm. And then a light went off in my head that this this is an important piece of information that needs to get out to the public, to people with AFib, to family members, to healthcare providers, is what is this disease really about? And bring everyone up to date on all of these great treatments that we have available and that we can get people who have even been in AFib for a long period of time, in many cases, get them into normal rhythm. Okay, well, you've already defined with a, what an arrhythmia is. How many different types are there? 
you could really think about them, Robert, in, in three categories. You have low heart rate rhythms, slow heartbeat rhythms, which are called bradyarrhythmias. And there's two types there. There's AV block, where the center part of the electrical system does not communicate the impulses from the top to the bottom, resulting in a low heart rate. You have something called sick sinus syndrome, where the cells on the top of the heart that create the heartbeat, the sinus node, have abnormalities and the heart rate can slow down. And those usually present with fainting, significant dizziness, or significant shortness of breath with activity. Those would be the symptoms. And then you have tachycardias, and tachycardias include rapid heart rhythms. And tachycardias can be broken down into regular tachycardias, where the heartbeat is fast, but very regular. There's no erratic nature to it. And then there's irregular tachycardias, and AFib falls in that category, where the heartbeat is quite irregular and chaotic. And if you almost think of music, Robert, if you think of music, your heartbeat should be like a metronome. And so if that heartbeat's too slow, it's this really slow rhythm. And if the heartbeat's really fast, it's a fast rhythm. And then if it's chaotic, if it's irregular, that can often be a sign of atrial fibrillation. Now, you mentioned um, that one in four people over the age of 40, I believe, um, yes. are, going, are going to suffer from AFib. How many Americans are currently living with AFib? Well, the estimates are at least 6 million, and that's probably an underestimate. Sure. And the reason why I say that is many people don't know they're in AFib. That's the scary part, is that AFib, I have a lot of different analogies that your audience may find helpful. It's electrical cancer. It's cancer of the heart. And what I mean by that is, just like any cancer, it starts out small. It starts out with a group of cells that fires erratically, and it's what we call paroxysmal AFib, where people will go into an episode of AFib and then convert back to normal rhythm. So they may show up to their doctor's office for a six-month follow-up and have an assessment, and they may be in a normal rhythm. But then that night, 2 o'clock in the morning for an hour when they're asleep, they may go into atrial fibrillation and not realize it. And so as episodes occur, more and more cells develop abnormal electrical components, and then eventually people go into continuous AFib, which is called persistent AFib. And so when people hit that persistent category, a lot of times the symptoms are just generalized fatigue, like people just don't feel well. Or if you, people feel really tired, and very commonly we hear, People say, well, I just thought it was getting older. I just thought it was my age. That's why I couldn't do as much. And it's not until they have an assessment of their rhythm, and there's a variety of ways to do that, where you realize, oh, wow, I'm actually, my heart's abnormal. In other words, they don't have the classic heart symptoms you would associate with, say, for example, a heart attack where people get chest pain and things like that. AFib may not create any heart symptoms. It may just create an overall sense of being unwell and fatigued. And the reason for that is the heart, again, if we get back to our analogy of it being an engine, the two top chambers, the atria, contribute about 30% of the pump performance to that engine. So when those top chambers do not contract properly, which is what AFib is, it's not an effective contraction, then the pump performance is reduced. And as a result, one of those classic symptoms can be simple fatigue. So 6 million Americans at this point are, are the general estimate. It's estimated that up to 16 million by the year 2050 will have AFib. The number one risk factor for AFib is getting older. It's like arthritis of the electrical system. Just like you get scar tissue in your knee, you get scar tissue in your electrical system. So that's the number one risk factor for it. That's why it's such a common condition. And it's not just obviously in the U.S., it's, it's worldwide. Sure. And so that, and, and it's estimated that about 750,000 people per year are hospitalized for something related to AFib. Yeah. So, so this, this, what's the cause? And the reason I ask is I, like I said before we started the interview, that I suffer from supraventricular tachycardia (SVT), which is similar but different. Um, and I'm in my 50s, and it just appeared, you know, a few years ago. Um, do, do we know the cause of AFib and some of these other arrhythmias, how they just pop up like that? 
Yeah, I mean, the the body's interconnected, right? And the autonomic nervous system, which is what controls all the body's vital functions, connects the brain to the gut, the brain to the heart, is, is intimately involved. And so when you look at the risk factors for developing AFib, it's a whole host of conditions. One of the number one risk factors, besides the age part that I mentioned, is obesity. Obesity creates an increased risk for AFib, diabetes, high blood pressure, valvular heart disease, valve heart disease in the heart, sleep apnea, which is a tremendously unrecognized trigger and risk factor for AFib, thyroid disease, heavy amounts of alcohol use, SVT and other cardiac arrhythmias act as risk factors for AFib. One in particular called WPW, or Wolf Parkinson White, that often kids will get diagnosed with, has an independent risk for developing atrial fib. And in fact, when we've done ablation, which is a curative treatment for a variety of different heart rhythm disorders, including SVT, which has a very high cure rate, we will actually see the SVT literally shift into atrial fibrillation during the procedure. Hmm. So it really tells you that there's this interconnection of the electrical tissue in the heart and with the body. And you can almost think of, Robert, as AFib as a sign of a body out of balance. And whether that's what someone's consuming or whether that's different disease states that are out of balance. And what's interesting now is, you know, I mentioned age over 65 is a, is a big risk factor, age. Well, now we're seeing a lot of athletes getting AFib. Right. And there's a very interesting component to that. It's that brain-heart connection. It's that autonomic nervous system. When you think of athletes, you think of low heart rate. And low heart rate is a sign of a conditioned heart. If you're not in good shape, your heart rate tends to run faster. If you're in good shape, if you run or play sports, your heart rate tends to run slower. Well, it turns out too much of a good thing is not a good thing. And so when that heart rate is really low, it's easier to trigger AFib. That's why people often get AFib at night when the heart rate slows down. And so athletes, and especially if you think about these high endurance athletes, the runners, the cyclists, and then the pro athletes, football players, for example, they have a six times increased risk of AFib, pro football players. And there's different reasons for that. That athleticism activates the vagus nerve, which is part of that autonomic nervous system that I mentioned, and it acts as an independent trigger for AFib. People who have these extra skipping heartbeats, which are called premature beats, have an increased risk of AFib and often go hand in hand with that athleticism. So it used to be that no one ever even heard of what a cardiac electrophysiologist was. <laughs> and now we've seen over time, because these rhythm issues have become so much more common, especially AFib, that the field of electrophysiology is now being more widely known by the public. So we're cardiologists, but we specialize in AFib. We specialize in the electrical system of the heart. Um, Dr. Desai, what are the early signs of AFib, and, and how do you diagnose it? That's a great question, Robert. So, you know, the classic symptoms that we talk about are what are called palpitations, which is a sense that your heart is doing something wrong. It's either beating fast or beating irregular or a combination of the two. And so palpitations often will occur in younger patients. And palpitations occur with SVT and a variety of other rapid heart rate disorders, ventricular tachycardia and a variety of others. But with AFib, you can have palpitations. And it's like a light switch. That's how, that's how these heart rhythm disturbances work in the beginning. So you're just hanging out with your friends, and then suddenly your heart rate takes off. And that's that sensation of palpitations. And the reason for that is, again, at a lower heart rate at rest, it's easier to trigger these abnormal rhythms. But it turns out that in older patients, oftentimes the palpitations are not a classic symptom. People may just feel short of breath, may have chest discomfort, dizziness, and I mentioned extreme fatigue. And so the early signs of AFib, which is that paroxysmal AFib, is there's, there's times where people feel terrible and there's times where people feel good. And, and that's when they're flipping back and forth. And then they just go into feeling terrible, and that's that continuous AFib. So classically, AFib is diagnosed, and other rhythm disorders are diagnosed by the electrocardiogram, the EKG, where you're in a doctor's office or an emergency room. They hook up a set of electrodes to you. And an EKG is basically a way in which we can assess the rhythm of the electrical system from a bird's eye view. The problem is, just like your car, just like your computer, just like your house, the electrical system can act up sometimes and not at other times. 
So when you take your body to the doctor's office, like taking your car to the mechanic, it may act just fine in the office because the EKG is just a few seconds worth of data. But as I mentioned, ACID comes and goes. So that's one of the things that people have the hardest thing wrapping their head around is, well, I see my doctor. I mean, I was told my heart's okay. And even heart tests can be normal. We do a variety of different tests, a stress test, imaging test called echocardiogram. Those can be normal and you can still have HIV. And so the EKG is sort of the initial diagnosis, but really it's the external heart rhythm monitors. And we have a variety of different kinds that continuously record your heart rhythm day in and day out. And, and now have the ability to pick up what we call silent AFib. In other words, AFib that people can't feel. So now, you know, our big push here, Robert, to the public, really to the public, is AFib is all about early detection, early intervention, electrical cancer. You catch it early, you treat it, you have a very high cure rate. If it progresses, the cure rate goes down, but there's still a lot of things that can be done for people. And so the rhythm monitors had been a big advancement. So you take people then that have a lot of risk for AFib, they're overweight, they drink a lot of alcohol, they're diabetic. A lot of times we will do these rhythm monitors as a screening tool to look for this problem. But again, AFib can come and go. You can have an AFib episode and then like not have another one for three months. Mm -hmm. And so if you wear a two-week rhythm monitor, you know, that's not going to pick it up. So we have a variety of different tools. We have what's called an implantable rhythm monitor. So it's almost the size of the matchstick, and it gets injected under the skin, and it can be done in the office. It's an outpatient procedure just with a local anesthetic. And this amazing piece of technology has the ability to monitor for AFib 24-7 and alert your doctor through cell phone networks and do this for up to three years, actually four years now. The newer generations just came out. So four years' worth of rhythm data, and you, it'll pick up, five minutes of AFib that occur four weeks from now. So it's really an amazing piece of technology. And and then, of course, Apple and another company, AliveCore, they've hit the market with wearable technologies. AliveCore was the first. They created a device called Cardia, $90 on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And this is a small piece of equipment that you put your fingers on the electrodes. It interfaces through Bluetooth with your smartphone. And you can do a 30-second recording of your EKG rhythm. It's actually pretty accurate when it comes to AFib. So if you have AFib and it, and it labels it AFib, that's actually relatively accurate. If you're in a normal rhythm and it labels it as a normal rhythm, that's also relatively accurate. The challenge it has is in the unclassified category. Right. And you can have an unclassified arrhythmia for one of two reasons. You're either not getting good electro contact with your, with your fingers and you'll have all this sort of wavy baseline and the device can't really say anything. Or you're having a lot of premature beats, these skipping beats that I mentioned, premature atrial or premature ventricular beats, and the device can't distinguish that versus AFib. And that's where, you know, a physician can obviously take a look at the tracings and, and you know, maybe even get an external heart rhythm monitor correlate. So that's a live core's product, Cardia Mobile. And then you have the Apple Watch. So the Apple Watch Series 4 was the first to build in the EKG technology, and now we're seeing it in every subsequent generation. And what it does is the same kind of thing. You can record a 30-second EKG. But as I mentioned, Robert, you may not see AFib in 30 seconds. So Apple is working on technology to diagnose episodes of AFib that people may not feel. In other words, silent AFib. So I've had a patients, for example, that bring me in their data on their smartphone and it shows a spike of the heart rate in the middle of the night of like, you know, going up to 180 beats a minute for like 30 minutes and there's no real reason for that. Well, it's either erroneous data or it's something. And it turns out in many cases it's, it's atrial fibrillation and you put a monitor on someone and it actually diagnoses AFib. So there's some indirect ways to use wearable technology to figure out if you're having silent episodes of AFib, especially if you start seeing that middle of the night rapid heart rate increase. And then you, the EKG recording part can be used if you have symptoms. So say, Robert, you know, tomorrow, sometime in the middle of the day, you're just not feeling right. You feel like there's something off. Either your heart's racing, it's irregular, or maybe you just feel extreme fatigue. You can do a recording off an Apple Watch or a Cardia Mobile and be able to, in real time, tell you 
whether it's possible you have AFib. And the challenge for doctors is, you know, our concern is that we're going to get inundated with a lot of data from people, and especially people that may not even be at risk for AFib, but they may be highly anxious, uh, understandably so, about their heart, and, and then it's going to overload the medical system with all this data. So, so we're really working on ways in which people can triage, that people can have as much artificial intelligence built into these devices that when it actually signals something, it's a true positive it's not a false positive, and then it'll lead to the proper doctor visit. That's amazing. So the, the CardioMobile today, it, it still doesn't compare to a regular EKG you would get in the hospital, though, right? Because there's not the same amount of no. electrodes? That's correct. If, that's correct. The CardioMobile device has come out with a six-lead electrode system. And what, what that means is basically you have the two finger electrodes, and then you have an electrode on the underside of the device that you can put on your knee or on your ankle to have skin contact. So you can create up to six different EKG leads in a sense. So so it is definitely more helpful. I don't think that that's necessary for, for the vast majority of patients. I think there are certain conditions like premature ventricular beats where we're trying to tell where they're coming from that it may be helpful to have the six-lead device. But you're right. The, there's no substitute for a 12-lead EKG. But again, the problem is unless you're actively having an episode or symptoms at the time, the EKG is really not going to reveal much. The EKG will tell you many things. Are you in a normal rhythm? Are your electrical intervals normal? In other words, are the impulses beating properly through the heart? You can pick up bradyarrhythmia problems, the low heart rate issues, the problems with what I mentioned, the AV node or the sinus node with an EKG often. You have what's called AV block first degree AP block, bundle branch block. These are things that can give some index of, you know, maybe there's something wrong with the electrical system. And then you can also tell if someone's had a previous heart attack in some cases with an EKG or if they're having an actual heart attack with an EKG. In fact, the CardioMobile device, it was developed by Eric Topol, who was previously the chair of cardiology at the Cleveland Clinic. He's now at Scripps in Southern California. And Eric developed this device in conjunction with the Live Corps. He actually diagnosed someone with a heart attack on a plane with that little cardiomobile device. That was actually one of the first applications wow. of it. It's not recommended. It's not recommended to be used in that context. But the point being is that you can get a lot of data from those devices. Yeah. Um, let me go ahead and switch gears a little bit and talk about treatment and control. And there's a number of treatment and control plans for AFib. Uh, Dr. Desai, can you discuss um, some of the things that are available out there? Absolutely. And then maybe before we touch on that, let me just highlight the three most critical aspects of what happens if you get AFib. Sure. Stroke. So stroke is one of the number one results of AFib, catastrophic stroke. And if you look at people who come into the hospital, one out of five patients who come into the hospital with a stroke, it's due to AFib. And it, again, people can show up in a normal rhythm, but they had AFib at home, and that was the trigger for the stroke. Because when the heart doesn't contract properly, a blood clot can form, and it can travel to the brain and cause a stroke. That's the mechanism. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things that you do when you assess a patient, you mentioned treatment, is determine their risk of stroke and determine whether they need to be on a special blood thinner or, or get a, a device to help prevent them from having a stroke. So stroke is one of the most catastrophic, and then congestive heart failure. If the heart is beating fast for long periods of time, it can weaken the heart muscle. Congestive heart failure, that's one of the number one reasons people come into the hospital with AFib is because they're in heart failure. And then the third is a significant reduction in quality of life. You know, these people are terrified. I mean, I've had patients that do not want to travel. You know, this is obviously pre-COVID, but do not want to travel because they're not near a hospital. Because right. they're afraid that if they're not near a hospital, there's a procedure called cardioversion where we shock the heart back into rhythm, and that's often done in the acute setting of AFib. It's it's not a it's not a treatment. It's really it's designed to treat a specific episode if someone's not getting back into normal rhythm on their own, but it doesn't prevent further episodes of AFib. But that being said, it reduced quality of life. And so you asked about the treatments. Well, the treatments you you have to take a holistic integrative approach to any medical issue nowadays, and, and AFib is no different. So as electrophysiologists, we were very narrowly focused. Now, we were focused on ablation, ways that we can freeze or cauterize the circuits. You go to most of our international meetings, it's all about ablation. Well, we finally started opening our eyes and realizing that you can ablate someone, 
But if that person's overweight, if that person's drinking alcohol, if that person has unrecognized sleep apnea, if that person's blood pressure is uncontrolled, that AFib is going to come back. That AFib, AFib is a systemic disease. So now we've done many studies showing if you take two people, one who does risk factor and trigger modification, and what I mean by that is losing weight, getting their blood pressure under control, really cutting out alcohol is what should be done, versus someone who doesn't, the outcomes of any treatment, whether it's an ablation, a drug, or what have you, are going to be better. I've had patients that have undergone up to four ablations, even at the Cleveland Clinic, and once they lost the weight, they went into normal rhythm. Hmm. So you cannot, you really have to start with lifestyle and risk factor modification. That's a part of the treatment. Does that fix all cases of AFib? No, but it definitely can help a lot of people with AFib, can prevent episodes. And that's why people who have diabetes and high blood pressure and and obesity who haven't developed AFib yet, they're at huge risk. And that's a huge population. So, so you got the lifestyle trigger modification. And I talk about a lot of this in my book. My book right. is really a playbook. It, it's the playbook for AFib. And so we're sort of using the sports analogy because the gentleman who wrote the forward is the president and CEO of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And as I mentioned, pro football players have a high incidence of AFib. He has AFib. He talks about it in his story. And and we talked about how the lifestyle is such an important part, and it made a big difference for him. Kenley Jansen from the Dodgers, who um, was in the media uh, uh, not that long ago about his AFib, had to get pulled out of the game in Denver. He went through all these ablation procedures, and it was finally when he got control of his blood pressure that his AFib got substantially better. So the lifestyle trigger modification, drug therapy. So there's drugs, there's beta blockers, there's calcium channel blockers, and there's antiarrhythmic drugs. Those are the three classes. At best, the strongest drug, which is amiodarone, that has a ton of toxicity, has only about a 50% success rate, so flip of a quarter, that the AFib is going to be controlled. We have not been able to develop a good, safe drug for AFib in decades. And the reason is it's a complicated disease, multiple different drug targets, and it's hard to find a drug that just affects the atrium without affecting the ventricle. And when it affects the ventricle, it can cause serious dangerous rhythms. And so that's why ablation has been really focused on. And so catheter ablation really comes in two forms currently radiofrequency, which is heating the circuits to eliminate them, to destroy those abnormal cells, and then cryoablation, which is freezing those circuits. And if you imagine a series of broken wires, we're repairing the insulation. What ablation does is it takes abnormal tissue, converts it to good scar, good scar meaning that the scar acts as an electrical barrier for those impulses to cause a fib. And nowadays, if you look at the success rate, and the challenge for your audience, you know, people hear such a range of success rates with different treatments, and and that's a problem. You know, one of the reasons I wrote the book is to provide credible information. I live and breathe AFib. I don't know the first thing about treating a urinary tract infection, (laughs) but I do know AFib. And the problem is that you don't have great credible information out there. And, and, and this is from even healthcare providers because AFib is such a rapidly moving target. It's nothing against anyone. It's just that if you don't live and breathe this disease every day, you're not going to know the latest treatments uh, available. So now a- ablation has about an 85 to up to 90% success rate in a paroxysmal patient where they're going in and out of AFib. In a persistent AFib patient less than a year of continuous AFib, about a 70% success rate in a, in a long-standing persistent greater than a year up to a 70% success rate, but they often require multiple procedures. And that's the key with AFib. You have to individualize to the patient. You can't just look at large scientific studies because we see time and again, it's like cancer. It's that cancer analogy, right? Like you can cut out a cancer, you can give chemo, you can give radiation, or you can do all three. And with AFib, Treating paroxysmal AFib with ablation, for example, you're cutting out the cancer. If you have persistent AFib, ablation plus a drug, you're giving chemotherapy to help keep the uh, disease in remission. We also use pacing. We use devices like pacemakers in certain cases of AFib, 
Many patients with AFib also have problems with low heart rate. They go fast, they go slow. It's called tachybrady syndrome. Mm-hmm. So pacemakers also have algorithms now built into them to help treat AFib. They're not a primary treatment, but the point that I'm making is we have a toolbox and you have to individualize to the patient and you have to treat the risk factor. Um, Dr. Desai, what are some of the most common misconceptions with AFib? Well, number one, that you have to just live in it, that you have to live with it. There are people that we can't get in the rhythm. We can still treat them with a variety of different techniques, including devices that help to prevent stroke without needing to take a blood thinner, for example. We can treat them with pacemakers in some cases. But the vast majority of patients with AFib, I would argue, and many of my colleagues would support that, are actually treatable. Like, we can get them into rhythm, and it may involve an ablation. It may involve a drug. It may involve some combination of treatments. But there's actually, at the American Heart Association, that meeting is going on right now, the American Heart Association, and there are two late-breaking trials that came out that basically showed that if you go to ablation first rather than going to a drug, you are going to have a better outcome. And the problem before and in the mindset, everyone thinks you have to fail a drug first to have an ablation. And I'm not saying everything is about ablation. I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is there's a misconception amongst healthcare providers and people alike that ablation doesn't work and that it's unsafe. And the, the, the risk of ablation has come down significantly to in the realm of about 1%. So now you're talking about procedures that have, you know, up to a 90% success rate with 1% risk, you're starting to get into a category where the treatment really does make sense for a lot of people. I'll continue. You got more to say about that topic? Oh, well, I was just going to say, you know, the, the, the other misconceptions are that alcohol doesn't really impact AFib, or if it's one glass of alcohol, not a big deal. Well, it turns out that one glass of alcohol has an 8% risk of triggering an AFib episode. So we are very adamant to people that if you want to prevent ablation, if you want to prevent this disease from getting worse, stop drinking. It, it's got a direct effect on the electrical system. It dehydrates you. It causes electrolyte imbalance. And so, so that's another big misconception. And probably the third is, You know, I'm not at risk for AFib. My heart's okay. I've been checked out. And again, like I said, if you carry the risk factors, you know, you could get it. And that's why people need to at least get into the habit of checking their pulse every day, whether it's in their neck, in their carotid artery, or their wrist, their radial artery, or they're wearing a device or something. It needs to be part of your daily routine, you know, just like checking your blood pressure, just like every other aspect of a a healthy lifestyle. You need to also monitor your heart's rhythm. Can, can, can you talk briefly about, you, you mentioned the vagal nerve, and yeah. there's a thing called vagal maneuvers. Can you can you describe what that's all about? Yeah, so, you know, you have your fight or flight response, right, Robert, which is the sympathetic nervous system. You know, these are evolutionarily designed for us to survive. You know, what, what causes our heart rate and blood pressure to go up when we're under any kind of physical uh, threat. Is, is what allows us to run away from that dinosaur or that saber-toothed tiger, right? Right. And so, but now we don't have as much of that physical threat, although COVID would be a good argument that we'd still do. We have emotional threats. We have mental threats. We're in a fight at work. We're in a fight at home. You can get the same kind of adrenaline response, and that can be bad for your heart. I wrote an article that actually showed that AFib is an independent risk factor for developing burnout and vice versa. If you have job burnout, you're actually at independent risk for developing AFib. There's actually data on that from, from studies. And it illustrates this, this negative impact of the fight or flight response. Well, you asked about the, you asked about the vagus nerve. So the parasympathetic nervous system is the counterbalance to the sympathetic nervous system. It's the rest and relax response. The vagus nerve is the primary form of that. It causes everything to slow down. So generally, that's a good thing. But as I mentioned, especially in high endurance athletes, by slowing the heart rate down too much, it can actually increase risk of AFib. There is a genetic component to AFib. We are now learning there are there are multiple genes that can be involved, and hopefully we'll get to a point like breast cancer and other cancers where we can identify these genes so we can have other ways of identifying who's at risk, for example, of getting AFib. 
you know, especially in the realm of uh, athletes. So the vagus nerve directly has input into the heart's electrical system, into the sinus node, into the AV node, the two central portions of the electrical system. Um, and, and so it can be a trigger for AFib, but it can also treat arrhythmia. So SCT, for example, supraventricular tachycardia, it requires the AV node, the central portion of the electrical system, to sustain the circuit. So if you imagine a merry-go-round, SVT is like your heart getting on that merry-go-round going really fast. So we have to figure out a way for that merry-go-round to stop. So a vagal maneuver is where you activate the vagus nerve on purpose, and the vagus nerve actually slows the heart rate down. You're using it to your advantage. And you can do that through coughing. You can do that through bearing down, which is called the Valsalva maneuver. You can do that through rubbing the carotid artery. I would not advise people to do that unless they're advised by their doctor to do that. But coughing and bearing down are, are very simple ways. You can breathe really hard into a small straw. You can submerge your face into ice. You know, these are different ways of activating the vagus nerve. And it's interesting you mentioned the vagus nerve. So, so the vagus nerve also innervates the GI tract. And so people who have esophageal problems like acid reflux, if someone eats a very large meal, fatty meal, that can actually trigger an episode of AFib, especially in people who have AFib. I'm not saying everyone, but it's someone who has AFib or is at risk for it. So it's a very interesting interplay, this vagus nerve, the sympathetic nervous system. We're still learning more and more about it. That's probably going to be the topic of my next book is how the heart and the brain are so intimately connected. Because we know this about the GI tract. We know this about the gut. And, and Robert, this kind of gets into the area of stress. So emotional and mental stress can be a trigger for cardiac arrhythmias. We see it all the time. Why? Because you're elevating adrenaline. You're elevating the stress hormones. Those have a direct effect on the electrical system. So one primary way to help modify a stress reaction is to breathe. There's a lot of data that deep, mindful breathing can actually reduce your stress response. How does it do it? By activating the parasympathetic nervous system. So the parasympathetic nervous system is, generally speaking, your friend. So when you do these deep breathing maneuvers, and this is based on, you know, sort of ancient cultures that figured this out. You do these deep breathing maneuvers, that can calm down your electrical system. Okay, um, let, let, let me just switch gears real quickly because I'm, this is a personal curiosity. Um, can you talk briefly about SVT and what's the difference between that and AFib? Yeah, SVT is a regular heart rhythm, a regular rapid heart rhythm, so not chaotic and irregular like AFib. It's typically not associated with stroke. It's typically not associated with death. In other words, the mortality from SVT is, is quite low. The biggest concern with SVT is the heart rate can go so fast, and I mean over 180, 200 beats a minute, that it reduces blood flow to the brain and people can faint right. and, and potentially hurt themselves. That's the greatest concern with SVT. Now, WPW, a subset of SVT, it can be associated with sudden death because WPW patients can go into SVT and they're, they're, can go into SVT, then can go into AFib, and their heart rate can go so fast that it causes a cardiac arrest. The vast majority of patients with SVT don't have that risk. And so you, you have a circuit. You have a short circuit, and you have two limbs to that circuit. And all that's required is one extra heartbeat, one of these premature beats, to trigger that circuit at the right time, the perfect storm, to set off an episode of SVT. And the symptoms would be a rapid, it's like a light switch. Suddenly, rapid, rapid heart rate. And then if you go back into normal rhythm through a Valsalva or treatment in the ER or what have you, immediately back, the light switch goes off again. And so there's a lot of ways to treat it. You can use drug therapy, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. You can, in some cases, it's lifestyle modification. In some cases, the SVT is being triggered by something like caffeine can be a trigger for arrhythmias in general. Uh, excessive amounts of caffeine, lack of sleep, dehydration, you know, all these things can be triggers for cardiac arrhythmias. And so SVT can be something that people only get one or two episodes a year, or it can be something where it can progress and people can get more and more episodes. And it is associated with an increased risk of AFib, AFib especially as you get older. So it is not a benign condition. It needs to be treated. It needs to be managed. Um, 
And catheter ablation has well over a 90, 95% success rate. There's three forms of SVT. There is AV nodal entry, there is bypass tract, and there's atrial tachycardia. So ablation has a lower success rate, for example, in something like atrial tachycardia, but it's still pretty good. But medical therapy has its role. Medical therapy has its role in all of those. You know, the beta blockers, the calcium channel blockers, those are generally speaking very safe drugs. They have side effects, fatigue, difficulty with exercise, erectile dysfunction in some cases with the beta blockers. So, but SVT is a very treatable rhythm. We're seeing less and less of it because people are being cured of it. And anyone who has SVT should definitely get evaluated by an electrophysiologist to see, you know, what their treatment options are. The, the last point about SVT is it can affect people of any age. So we have babies that get SVT that have genetic conditions. Mm-hmm. We have, my youngest patient was 14. We have patients as old as 90 that get SVT. SVT peaks at certain decades of life. So you can get it when you're younger, in sort of your teens and your 20s and your 30s. You can get it when you're older, in your 50s and 60s. Well, I've had you on the line for quite a while now, so I'm going to ask you just any final thoughts on AFib or heart arrhythmias in general. Yeah, I would say to your audience that AFib, early detection, early intervention, there's a lot of misinformation out there, so be informed that it's important to have a set of tools that you can turn to with any heart health problem, especially with heart disease and AFib, things that help you modify stress, things that help you keep a fit lifestyle because that will reduce your chances of AFib, that AFib is a major cause of stroke, unrecognized, that people can walk around with silent AFib, and that we have lots of great treatment options nowadays. And my book really goes through the whole gamut of our conversation. Um, It's available anywhere books are sold. We'll be running a couple of holiday promotions. Uh, It's available on Amazon and Barnes & Nobles. And I'm very active on social media. So my website is drasendasai.com, D-R-A-S-E-N-D-A-S-A-I.com. I have a blog, lots of great information on there. And then my handle for social media is at drasendasai. So I'm on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, I encourage your audience, if they have any questions, feel free to message me. Well, very good. And yes, I read this book and he is absolutely correct. Uh, He does cover all the stuff from this interview and much, much more is really outlined very well. And um, the book, again, is titled Restart the Heart, excuse me, Restart Your Heart by Dr. Asim Desai. And I'll link to it in the show notes if listeners are interested in checking it out. And I want to thank you, Dr. Asim Desai, for sharing your time, your expertise, and congratulations on a really good book. Thank you for having me, Robert.